we're going to be talking a little bit about chemistry. I know you might be thinking to yourself, why in the world are we talking about chemistry when this is a living environment class? But living things are made up of chemical compounds. So we need to go back to a little bit of the basics of chemistry that you might have learned last year and the year before in order to understand how living things work and what makes us tick. So the formal definition of chemistry, we talk about chemical compounds being the substances that form matter. So there are three terms that we're going to review today quickly before we get into some of the other things. The first term is the atom and how it relates to an element and how they relate to compounds. They're all interconnected with each other, but how are they really related? We'll get into a little of the details today. So in terms of an atom, that's really our simplest or smallest unit of matter. Some examples of atoms could be carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And I know you've heard of most of these before. One of the things to think about with an atom is that you really can't see these with the naked eye. So sometimes they're a little difficult to understand. Typically when we think of atoms, these things are things that are found as a single unit, a single atom, not more than one. If we're talking about more than one of the same kind of atom, that would be an element. An element is more than one unit of a single type of atom. So some examples of that would be the oxygen that's in the air. It's not just one atom of oxygen that we're referring to. We're referring to two oxygen atoms that are bonded together that make up oxygen gas. In addition to the nitrogen gas that's in the air, nitrogen usually doesn't occur in nature as one single atom. It's usually two nitrogen atoms bonded together making up that element of nitrogen gas. They're usually represented as O2 and N2. Now how does an atom and an element relate to a compound? Well, a compound, the formal definition, are two or more types of atoms that are chemically combined in definite proportions. So what that really means is that they're not just mixed up in the air like the oxygen and the nitrogen gas. They've actually gone through a chemical reaction in order to form a new substance. So some examples of compounds that you're familiar with would be CO2, which is carbon dioxide, H2O, which is water, and a new one that maybe you don't know the formula for, but you've heard the name before probably, is c 6 h 12 O6, which makes up glucose. Glucose is one of our most common simple sugars that we're going to be discussing later on. Just as a quick review for you that some of you might have forgotten, when you're looking at an equation, or when you're looking at a chemical compound and the formula for it, the C represents the symbol for that particular atom of carbon, and to the lower right of it, if there's a number to the lower right of it, a subscript, that tells you how many of that atom appear in that compound. If there's no number to the lower right of it, we assume that there's only one of them. So in the example of CO2, or carbon dioxide, we have one carbon atom bonded to two oxygen atoms. In the case of water, we have two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen. And then we get into some more complex things like glucose, which happens to have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. Moving along, as we work into our chemical molecules, our chemical compounds, we can talk about different types of compounds. The first and the simplest are inorganic compounds. And the definition for that is that a compound that does not contain both carbon and hydrogen in them. So when we talk about inorganic compounds, they may have carbon or they may have oxygen. But the key is in order to be inorganic, they couldn't have both in the compound. So some examples of the inorganic compounds would be water, it has hydrogen in it, but since it doesn't also have carbon, it's considered to be inorganic. And remember, water is H2O. <clears throat> Excuse me. Water happens to be the most abundant inorganic compound found on Earth. If you remember back to your, some of your 7th and 8th grade material, water makes up at least about 70% of the Earth and makes up most of the human. Carbon dioxide is another example. 
Carbon dioxide is carbon and two oxygens bonded together. So see, we do have the carbon, but we don't have any hydrogen with it. So it's still inorganic. Hydrochloric acid, which is found in the stomach to help with digestion, that's hydrogen and the CL is chlorine. And then we have ammonia, which some of you might know as a cleaning compound, but we'll talk about it later on in the human body as well. And ammonia has N for nitrogen and then three hydrogens. So once again, we have some hydrogen, but there's no carbon there, so it's not organic. It's inorganic. Moving on from the inorganic compounds, <clears throat> in order to form these compounds, they need to go through something called a chemical reaction. And I know you've probably talked about these before, but this will be a quick review for you. A chemical reaction is when one or more substances chemically changes into new substances. It may be only one new substance in the end of the reaction, but the idea is, is they're not just physically mixed together. It's a new substance that we formed. In terms of chemical reactions, we talk about two parts of the reaction. We have the reactants, and then we have the products. The reactants, many times, you'll see them called raw materials, and that's because those are the starting substances in your reaction. Those are the things that you start off with, the raw materials that you put together in order to form this new product. These are typically shown to the left of the arrow when you write out the chemical reaction, and we'll see that in a second. The products, we also sometimes refer to them as end products, and these are the end substances, or the things that get created in the reaction, the things that are sometimes we call them made. These are typically shown to the right of the arrow. So we have an example reaction that I'd like you guys to write down, and it happens to be two hydrogen, and this is called a coefficient. It means that we're taking two hydrogen atoms, adding to one oxygen atom. So two hydrogens and one oxygen, these are shown to the left of our arrow, and these are considered to be our reactants. The arrow represents the reaction occurring, so I'm following the reaction from left to right. And my products, the things at the end of the reaction, in this case, we just have one product, which happens to be water, or H2O. The left of the arrow are the reactants, to the right of the arrow are the products. You could maybe possibly only have one reactant that gets broken down into multiple products, or it could be the other way around like this one, where you have multiple reactants in one product. In some cases, you may have multiple products as well. Moving on from our chemical reactions, a lot of times when we talk about chemical compounds, we talk about some things that maybe might be familiar to some of you and maybe might not be. An acid, a neutral, or a basic compound. And a lot of times we'll talk about the pH of a solution. The pH is really just a measure of the hydrogen ions, the H plus ions, in a solution. Hydrogen ions come from that compound. When you take it and put it into a solution of, let's say, water, they break down and the hydrogen gets released and they get added to the solution, which can make them very acidic in some situations. So our true definition of an acid is something that has a high concentration of hydrogen ions, or in some cases we may say have a low concentration of something called OH minus ions, and you'll see a little bit more about that in a minute. The pH range for an acid is anywhere from zero to less than seven. Acids are typically found in the stomach, hydrochloric acid. Lemons have acids in them, and batteries have acid. Anybody that's ever worked on cars or worked with batteries, if a car battery explodes, you could actually have some very serious burns from it because that acid in there is a very strong acid. It's called sulfuric acid. It's very strong, can cause some very serious burns. And that is one characteristic of an acid. They're known to cause very serious burns if it's a strong acid. So some examples of acids that you'd like to write down. Citric acid, which you could think of from our citrus foods, like our lemons and our oranges and things like that. Vinegar, which many of you guys are probably familiar with, which has a fancier name of acetic acid, which you don't need to write down at this point. And then the hydrochloric acid, which we abbreviated before as HCl, which is found in our stomach, which helps with digestion. Moving along from the acids, as you get a little bit closer and you get to a pH of 7, you would have what's considered to be a neutral pH. 
If you're neutral on a situation, let's say in an argument, you haven't decided either way which you're going to go to. Are you going to go towards one side or the other? And that's kind of the case you can think of with pH. If something is in the neutral pH range, it's in the middle of the pH scale, which in this case happens to be a pH of 7. The definition of a neutral compound is one that has equal concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide, or OH ions. Typically, our neutral compounds are going to form when we combine a strong acid and a strong base together. When you form, take a strong acid and a strong base and put them together, typically you're going to form some sort of a salt and a water compound. And the water in this case happens to be neutral. So pure water, not necessarily the water that you find in a pond or a stream, but a pure water molecule is a neutral compound. On the other end of the spectrum, we have our bases. And bases have a low concentration of hydrogen ions, and they typically are known to have a high concentration of those OH minus ions, or hydroxide ions, we call them. So the pH range for a base happens to be less than 14, but above 7, because remember, 7 was our neutral. Typically, when we think of our bases, they're very slippery to the touch. Not that you would always want to touch some of the bases that we work with in the lab, but they typically feel very, very slippery. And a good example of that, a lot of bases are used as cleaning compounds. So even soap is slightly basic. And as you put the soap on your hands, you can feel it sliding and gliding in your hand. There are some other good examples of bases as well such as ammonia, which some people use for their cleaning compounds, sodium hydroxide, which is found in drain cleaner, and calcium hydroxide, which is called lime water. Moving on from our pH definitions, one of the things that we like to look at, especially with the living environment curriculum, is what are some of the common things that we find around us and in the world around us, and what are their pH ranges, or where do they typically fall on the pH scale? And the pH scale is really just the range of pH values that you would find for a substance or a liquid, and it ranges from 0 to 14. Typically, when we look at our pH scale, the strongest acids are going to be closest to 0. The strongest bases are going to be closest to 14. And as you head closer and closer and closer to that neutral point of 7, the strong acids become weak acids and eventually neutral, so neither acidic or basic. And as you get from 14 closer to 7, your strong, strong bases become less basic, closer to neutral. So a couple of things I'd like you to think about for a minute are, can you think of any household items and where they might fall on the pH scale? So pause for a second and see if you can make a short list for yourself and try to estimate where you think they might fall. A couple of questions that you might think about is, how do you test the pH of a solution? Do you remember from seventh and eighth grade what you might have used to test pH? In our class, we're going to be using something called litmus paper. And litmus paper typically comes in two colors, red litmus paper and blue litmus paper. We're going to do a lab probably this week that has red litmus paper and blue litmus paper in order to test the pH of an unknown substance. When you put the red litmus paper in the solution, if it's an acid, it will stay red. If it's a base, it'll turn blue. And when you put the blue litmus paper in a solution, the blue litmus paper will stay blue in a base and it will turn red in an acid. Could you possibly think of an easy way to remember which colors they should turn depending on what kind of substance you put them in? Maybe you've got a trick. We'll talk about it tomorrow in class. Another question you might think about are, what about people that have pools? Are there tests that you run if you have a pool in order to test pH? We're going to talk about that a little bit more tomorrow possibly as well. Maybe some of you have some experience testing the pH of your pool. What do you add if the pH isn't quite right? Another question you might think about is, what do people take antacids for? Think about that word itself, antacid. What does it mean to you? We're going to talk about that tomorrow and what an antacid is and what it's used for. And tomorrow, we're going to fill in this pH scale. 
what I'd like you to do tonight is I'd like you to find some of those common household items and I'd like you to see how many of the items you can find in order to fit on this scale. And tomorrow when we come into class, we're going to fill in as many items as we can on the scale and see what you found.